Thank you very much, Cyrus. I'll start. My name's Eric Senko. I just want to thank Cyrus, Sherry, thank uh, Professor Ming Lu for helping set this up. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with everyone. I want to thank all of you for joining. This is uh, taking time out of your day, but hopefully you guys will find it worthwhile. Quick background um, for me, I grew up in San Diego. I worked in finance for about 20 or so years, primarily in London and Hong Kong. Eventually ended up running my own hedge fund in Hong Kong. I retired in about 2013 and I started teaching at SMC in 2016. I teach personal finance, investments, and then general business classes. I also do volunteer financial counseling and that's how uh, the lessons I've learned and I'm going to try to impart to you, that's that's all from my experience working with people. I almost exclusively work with people with uh, zero to negative net worth who generally have uh, large debt problems. And so it's trying to work through those debt problems. So I have a lot of experience with this. So let me, and then the way I lecture is just very open-ended. Well, you'll see, we'll go into that there. Let me share my screen here. Can everyone see the screen? We sure can. Yeah, everyone can see this. Okay, now actually I worked in finance for 20 something years, but I always wanted to be a history professor. So, uh, you know, we can't always realize our goals in life. So I always try and bring lessons from history into my lectures. And I only have about 20 minutes or so. So I'll try to be quick. I don't know if we have time to get through all of this. This is the Roman emperor Caligula. Oops. Slides don't work, there we go. He was only emperor for about four years before he was killed. People said of him, he was an excellent servant, but a poor master. He was very obsequious, would do whatever you wanted if you were the emperor, but once he became emperor, it was horrible. And that's why he got killed after a few years. Money, much like Emperor Caligula, is an excellent servant, but a poor master. So the goal of these kinds of workshops is to get it so that money is working for you and not controlling you. And Professor Lou's gonna have some great insight in the second half of this and budgeting and how you can get to that stage of your life. Hopefully most of you are there already, but you never know. There's always a way to get there. So this is a lecture on debt. That is my contact info there. I think Cyrus has probably sent it out or maybe will do so later on. You can always feel free to reach out to me if you have questions later on. Quick disclaimer, just like Cyrus said, and he popped in the chat. Uh, this is personal for many people, right? people from different cultures, different types of families, you know, not everyone is comfortable talking about finances. And I've lived all over the world and um, spent time with families from totally different cultures. And some are very open about this stuff and others, it is like the most taboo thing you can talk about. So I would encourage you if you want to discuss things, but don't feel compelled. You can always do what I do. And I always go, my friend has this situation et cetera, et cetera. It might be you, it might be your friend, who knows. If we're talking about a bad investment and I say my friend made a bad investment, it's almost certainly me that we're talking about, whatever. That being said, none of this is financial advice. If you follow my financial advice, you are almost guaranteed to lose money in terms of stocks and trading. So don't, just listen to what we're talking about in terms of debt. So quick list of topics. We're gonna to talk about what debt is, what is it, how it works, why it exists, and then a little something if we have time, Il bono, il bruto, and il cattivo. So why give a talk on debt? Sorry, let me move some of my windows here so I can see my whole presentation. I haven't given this via Zoom yet. So obviously I lecture via Zoom tons, but this is the first time I've given this presentation. As a volunteer financial counselor, I work exclusively with people who have financial issues, primarily too much debt. What do you think people say is the solution to their financial problems? when I sit down with them and we say, okay, you don't have a lot of assets, you make uh, some money and you have a ton of debt. How are you going to get out of that? What's the solution? Stop spending money. Okay, <laughs> that is actually the right answer. <laughs> what people always say is I need to make more money. And that's pretty much what everyone says, I need to make more money. Well, let's look at this. This is basically the percentage of people in each income group who are living paycheck to paycheck. Now, obviously people over here 
under 15, under 25, under 50,000 living paycheck to paycheck, that doesn't really surprise us. It doesn't surprise me. But hey, a third of the people who make over 200 grand a year are living paycheck to paycheck. Right? Their problem is not that they don't make enough money. Their problem is they spend too much. Now, obviously, we all live in L.A., right? It's very easy to say, oh, yeah, I could, I could make 200 grand in L.A. and spend all of that every single week, right? So the question is, and this is what Professor Liu is going to talk about later on, is how do we live within our means, right? That is the solution. Now, many of you, I don't, sorry, I don't, I haven't given this before. I like to do polling. Let me see if I can see everyone here. Do you guys know how to do the little emojis? On the thing, what do we got about 20 people here? Where are the emojis for mine now? Anyway, um, anyone have, oh, there we go. There we go. Somebody's doing it there. Thank you. Um, what I find in my classes and in my counseling is that the bulk of my students have debt in one form or another, primarily auto debt, student loan debt. A few of them will have things like payday loans. The problem is very few of them actually understand what debt is. They know how to get it because the system is designed to make it very easy for you to take out debt, but they don't really understand what it is. And so the people who take my classes, and I know one of you in here has, thank you for attending, in my classes, we learn what it is. Why would someone lend you money? Let's say you're one of our students and you're 20 years old and you want to buy a car and someone says, sure, I'll lend you 25 grand to buy a new Toyota Camry because you are spending tomorrow's money today. Money that you earn in the future, you've already spent. Now, if you're buying a car, you might, okay, I need the car to get to work. I need the car to pick up my kids. I mean, we live in LA after all, right? It's probably very difficult to exist here without a car. So there's a good justification for having some form of a car. When it gets tricky is when we're talking about stuff like credit cards. What do we buy when we buy stuff on our credit card? Anyone made a credit card purchase recently? Not a single one of you, 20 of you here. Well, if you guys haven't used your credit cards, nobody needs to be here. You could all- I use American Express. That is my cash cow. <laughs> same here, same here. Back at the end of every month. That is my cash cow for sure. <laughs> Just so we're clear, if you buy something on a credit card and you do not pay the credit card off in full at the end of the month, you are borrowing money. Yeah. Credit card interest rates range from 15 to 25%. What do we buy on our credit cards? Well, you, know, you guys aren't, most of you are younger than I am, but the, my students are a lot younger than I am. And I always accuse them of being hipsters. And I go, you guys are always buying avocado toast, right? You're paying $15 for avocado toast. You're putting it on your credit <laughs> card and then you don't pay the bill at the end of the month. So you're borrowing money to buy avocado toast. Is that a sensible use of debt? Probably not. Now the mechanics, what are these? Not a trick question. Rental car? Yeah, rental cars. When you <laughs> borrow money, you are using someone else's money. And it's exactly the same as when you go to rent a car. You have three variables. The amount that you're borrowing. If you buy a car, you're probably going to borrow something like $15,000, $25,000. Maybe if you're like, I'm really rich, I'm going to borrow seventy-five dollars to buy a Mercedes. If you buy a house, maybe half a million. Good luck getting a house for half a million in L.A. Credit card little bit less, a payday loan, much less. The second variable is the interest rate. This is the equivalent for the car of what is the daily charge? How much are you paying per day? Or in this case, we make it per year so we can compare apples to apples. 
And then how long do you need the money? Well, a car, you're gonna use the money for five to seven years, a house 15 to 30, credit cards are 20 to 25, payday loans are one to three years. Everyone who takes my class, I advise them to download on their phone something like this, a loan calculator. And you can say, oh, I'm gonna buy a Honda, $20,000 I'm gonna borrow for six years at 5%, and then you hit calculate. This tells you the monthly payment. This tells you the interest paid over the life of the loan, the total charge for borrowing this much money. What happens if I change this from 5% to 10%? This interest paid number, is it gonna go up, down, or stay the same? It's gonna go up. $6,600 and change, right? So if you can reduce your interest rate to say 3%, and I, so I will often have a student in my class who comes up to me after class and says, oh, here's my loan. I don't really understand it. And we go through it. Okay, you borrowed $20,000 over more likely seven years at 15%. This is her monthly payment. This happened last semester. So I'm, I've got a particular student in mind. Her monthly payment was 385. So she borrowed 20 grand. She has to pay that 20 grand back. Plus she has to pay $12,000, which is the cost of borrowing the money. Well, we talked about how to refinance and get a lower interest rate. She was able to move her loan to 3% and save herself $10,000. What I always tell my students is, if you take my class, it costs you $150. I can pretty much guarantee you, you will get that much value. Well, she saved 10 grand by taking my class. So hopefully she felt that kind of value. Um, Rosalind, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. This is just bank rates app. I'll pop it in there. Uh, but you can just go and look. Uh, if you go on your um, app store, whatever, and just type loan calculator, they're all pretty much the same. And they'll just have those three inputs. Now, Christina says, I do most of my shopping on a credit card, but I pay it off each month. Is Christina borrowing money? No. Correct, right? Okay. She's not paying any interest for that. So that's great. That's actually the only reason you really should use credit cards. One exception, I had a student who was a welder and he said, I had to buy welding equipment. Obviously, who's gonna hire a welder without welding equipment? I wouldn't imagine hiring a welder and the guy shows up and goes, okay, I need a torch and I need this and that and all of those big tanks and everything like that. So he, he borrowed $5,000 on his credit card, paid 20% interest, but now he can work as a welder. So he is using the asset that he purchased to pay off the debt. That's a sensible use of credit card. That was pretty much his only option. Go back to my slides. So these are the major kinds of um, debt that we will encounter in our lives. Interest rates, as we said, the cost of debt, the cost of money. If you want to rent a car from someone, they say the daily rate is $17. What's the main difference between borrowing money and renting a car? So you rent a car, you go to Hertz, which I guess is still in business. They're sort of, bad. I think they just came out of bankruptcy. They give you a car, you drive it around, you give them the car back. And then they say, okay, your total cost is X. It's the same thing with money. There's only one difference. Can anyone think of that difference? Anyone rented a car recently? Not recently. You have to pay for the miles. Remember? <laughs> Sorry, who said yes? Um, I said I haven't rented a car recently, but typically once you, you know, get what did you car, rent? Uh, I rented with Avis. Okay, what kind of car? Oh, it was a Chrysler Pacifica in 2018. 
Okay, so you rented a minivan, right? Correct. When did you, you specifically wanted a minivan, presumably, or you want a small car or a convertible or something like that. That's the only difference. A dollar is a dollar. When you go and borrow money, you don't care if they give you 520s or $100 bill or whatever. Okay. When you return a car, presumably you're going to return the exact car that you rented from them, not just a random car. You rent a Chrysler Pacifica and go, oh yeah, by the way, here's a Toyota Camry back. There's going to right. be a bit of a That's problem. True. I had to give them the car that they gave me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should try that one time. Who knows? I would prefer to keep the, the Pacifica. <laughs> now, why do we use debt? This is a, usually I draw this slide by myself. I like to think my, uh, my artistic ability is about on a par with this, i.e. pretty bad. Um, but generally what we do is we borrow earlier in life. We might want a car to get started. We might borrow money to buy a house. We might borrow money to get an education. Then as our income, so this is our income, this green line, as our income grows, as we get older, we should be paying back this money that we borrowed here. And then we start saving, we start investing so that once we stop working, we still have income from the investments we made back here, right? And when Professor Liu talks about his stuff, he's gonna talk about budgeting and basically how to keep your consumption, this blue line, what we buy, you wanna keep that lower. And if your blue line is way, way, way up here, well, you're gonna be in debt your whole life. And I watched a uh, documentary on Thomas Jefferson and there was this historian they were interviewing and the, the woman said, oh, such a shame, such a, such a shame. Thomas Jefferson died massively, massively in debt. It's so sad. And I was watching with my buddy and my buddy goes, what? He won. That's awesome, right? He got to spend more than he earned and produced his whole life. That's how I want to go. I was like, okay, I'd actually lent him money. So uh, that's not what I wanted to hear personally after having lent him money. Now, um, let me see what time do we have. I'll just, what I generally do in class and we might not have time for it today because I wanna open it up to questions, but we compare different kinds of loans. And hopefully some of you know what this is, this photo here. No, maybe not, okay. My I guess husband's I'm saying the good, the bad and the ugly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we talk about loans and which kinds of loans are good, bad, and ugly. Now, generally mortgages are good loans because it's an asset you have that goes up over time in value. Credit cards are generally bad because we buy stuff that isn't a real asset Payday loans are probably the worst and in my mind should be illegal, but whatever, I'm not running the government. And then we talk about student loans. And there's always a lively debate in class. Are student loans good? Are they bad? Are they ugly? Depends. And then I have a ton of, of slides and data here. Um, this is the amount of student loans since 2006. There were 500 billion, now there's about 1.7 trillion. And ironically, enrollment has declined since this date, roughly. Um, the number of people here who have a credit card and don't pay it in full, again, a third of the population who makes more than 100 grand. So this, again, dovetails right into Professor Liu's talk about budgeting, right? People making 100, 200, $300,000 are living paycheck to paycheck. Right? That, that's a problem. It's a problem for them. It's a problem for all of us. So there's some more stats on credit cards. I don't want to eat up all the time. What kind of thoughts or questions do you guys have on this? Was this useful information? Was it new? Do I know all this information? Did I just waste 20 minutes of everyone's life that they'll never get back? I think it's all, it's all very useful information, Eric. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions this time that they want to pose? Uh, you have to put it in the chat or raise your hand on the participants list. Um, uh, I have a question. Go ahead, Juliana. I don't know if this is part of your presentation or the, the rest of the presentation, but you mentioned like the credit card, you, shopping with the credit card. And I 
And you're like, well, those who haven't don't need to be here. So I have it. I have never opened an actual credit card other than like Macy's like, but because I'm not the best at paying on time, I'm just forgetful. So I've always been worried that it's going to, you know, ruin my credit because I'm just so forgetful and I forget it, you know. Um, but I've also heard it's really difficult to build your credit without the use of credit. So I'm wondering, I guess, how you balance or make that decision or what you recommend. That's a fantastic question. I get that question a lot. Personally, I am not of the orthodox school of thought. The orthodox school of thought is get a credit card, use it, pay it off every month, right? Mm -hmm. If you do that, that is fine. We're all human, right? Allegedly, I've never used heroin. My cousin died of a heroin overdose. Apparently heroin is amazing the first time you use it. The problem is you keep using it, trying to get that original high. So then you should just tell everyone, hey, you know what? Use heroin once and then quit. Mm -hmm. Is that good advice? Probably not, mm -hmm. right? That's probably terrible advice. That's gonna result in a lot of heroin addicts. So now, not having a credit score, not having great credit scares people. I own apartments down in San Diego and Whenever someone applies, we check their credit. A number of people don't have credit scores and they say, oh, I don't use credit. Mm -hmm. You know what all of those people have in common? They all have minimum $25,000 in their savings account or their checking account. So they go, oh, I don't, I don't use credit. We, we don't like my, my girlfriend and I, my boyfriend and I, whatever, we don't use credit. I go, okay, can I see your bank statements? Okay, sure. Here's my last three months of bank statements. Here's $27,000 in my account, $18,000 in his account. Am I going to rent to those people? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. I, I've turned down people with good credit because they are so close to the line. They make good money. But my property manager goes, look, Eric, if one of them loses a job, they're toast. They've got two cars, they've got a jet ski, they've got an ATV, they've got this, they've got that. It's all on credit. So again, you know, you have to determine what's right for you. Like Professor Lou says, this is just informational advice and I don't want somebody to sue me if they ruin, get all their finances ruined. But in my experience, the people who don't use credit have lots of cash on hand. And Christina, this, this is a great point. What about getting a mortgage? This is where you kind of run into a problem. I'm actually kicking around the idea of opening my own bank because I think that the real solution to this problem is rolling back the last 30 years of credit expansion. But that's, I don't want to go off. I go off on tangents in class all the time. It's, it's no, that sounds like a good credit. tangent. Who, who opens a bank? <laughs> Thank you, by the way. And I, I may have missed the first few minutes. What's the class that you teach? I teach intro to investments and personal finance. Thank you. Oh, and then Ju Ju Juliana, I was just going to say, you, you asked um, Eric in, in the beginning, like you've sometimes, you mentioned that you sometimes forget payments. You, you do realize you can set it to automatically withdraw from your checking account, right? So that, that's why if you, like I, I used to forget as well, but I just set it yeah. so it's automatically withdraw. I was very old school and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be the one who does, you know, and, and like, I just don't trust. I'm like, they're going to take money out of my account. No, but, you know, years lessons learned later. I'm like, okay, everything needs to be on auto pay. So, cause I do have a lot of, you know, school loans. So, so everything's much better. My credit's looking much better now. <laughs> I'm going to say, Juliana, one of the things I do is I literally set an alarm on my phone, on my calendar, between three to five days of whatever particular bill is going to come out, just so I'm, you know, aware of the fact that okay, such and such is going to come out of this account. And just make sure that Reminder. Oh, I see. I see. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. That's a good idea. Anything else, or shall we move on to uh, Professor Lou's discussion? I do have one question. Um, so, if I have a credit card and I I'm a real big fan of cash back because mm -hmm. I figure if I was going to buy something anyway, I might as well kind of put a little bit more money back in my pocket. So if I have a card, I buy the item and I pay it off, uh, you know, within the, by the, by the due date, 
is that a good way to do things um, as far as yeah. credit cards? Or yeah, 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 100%. Whatever. What, what you're, you're actually borrowing money and paying no interest, right? You're just using your card as a substitute for cash. So if you yeah, buy $500 worth of stuff every month and your bill comes and you pay it in full, mm -hmm. you're not actually borrowing money. And you're probably getting like airline points or hotel points or cash back or whatever it is. The, right. you know, obviously you've got an amazing flat that you live in there. So that's probably why you're, <laughs> what you're buying with it. <laughs> oh man, I was like, what an awesome view. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Deanna. Wonderful. Um, are there any additional questions at this moment? Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I'll stay on here, but now we're gonna hear from uh, our budgeting guru. Yes, absolutely. Ming, I'll put a spotlight on you, but if you wanna ask um, any uh, questions to Eric, Eric, would you be okay if people sent you uh, direct messages in the chat to possibly- Yeah, yeah, questions? yeah, if you have already. So Perfect, thank you very awesome. Much. Yeah, I wanna take your class too. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I gotta, and for anybody that's a classified professional, you know, we do cover tuition. And so uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people take personal finance courses uh, in addition to the uh, watercolor courses or any PE courses. So know that that, that is an option for everyone. So, um, but uh, I'll turn it over to Ming. Ming, I'm gonna put a spotlight on you and the floor is all yours. Okay, let me see if I can open my documents here. Can you give me this? Oh, I can share screen. Okay, give me one second here. Share screen. Can everyone see my um, can everyone see my notes and Word document? Let me adjust my screen a little bit. Can you see the, the Word document notes? Not quite. We we see the uh the ear your uh your outlook. Oh, my see your email. I yes. See, I see an me, email I sent you. <laughs> let me share the right screen. Let's see. How about um, this now? Can you guys see the screen with the notes? I believe it's still loading. Perfect. There we go. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, oh, by the way, uh, Eric, you know, I, I had Cyrus send out my, my, uh, this Word document along with the sample budget. Perhaps people may be interested in your PowerPoint slides. I guess you can pass it on to Cyrus for to give to everyone else. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, I, you know, since Eric introduced himself, I'll just talk a little bit about my background. My name is uh, Ming Liu. I teach uh, accounting and personal finance class, mainly accounting classes, but also teach one personal finance class. Uh, each semester at SMC. Um, my background is that I, I studied um, economics and accounting undergrad and did a master's in tax. Um, I did my grad at, Ber at Cal Berkeley studying economics and accounting. Then I did master's in uh, tax at, at USC. And for a while I used to work, work in corporate America um, with, with taxes. And then now, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm semi-retired because I get to do things I really enjoy, which is to help students learn uh, about accounting and also personal finance. And, and, and interesting, Eric, you actually want to be a history major. I wanted to be a history major too, but um, uh, <laughs> I wind up doing, doing all this other stuff now. So um, quick disclaimer, uh, you know, this is all for educational purposes. Um, so don't, don't come and sue myself or <laughs> Eric later on if you uh, somehow blow away millions of dollars. That's not the point, right? We're, we're here to just provide um, some general advice, and hopefully um, you'll you know, improve your life, right, financially. And if you, you should always consult a, your, your accountant or financial advisor, all right? I'm sure 99.99 people are going to do this, but there's always one person who will just misinterpret what we just said, okay? So I wanted to, um, I, don't want, I don't know if there's a way, well, I wanted to ask, like, do most of you guys budget? How many of you guys uh, budget? I was curious. I wish there was a way to do a, a, a poll. But yeah. most like, people, like I budget, but I'm not good at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let me just share with you this, right? Uh, you know, I teach accounting students, and even accounting students, I would say in my typically in my class, only 10 percent of the students budget, right? 
And I, you know, I have a lot of friends who always tell me like, oh, you know, Ming, I don't have, an, I don't have enough money. And my friends, uh, most of them are married. And so it's up between husband and wife, they, you know, most of them make between 200 to $300,000. And they're like, oh, you know, <laughs> I just can't make money ends meet. Like life is so hard. And then I always ask people, do you budget? And the answer is no. So I, I would say the, like my students, my students, only 10% of them budget. My friends, only only 10% of them budget. So, you know, I tell them, look, if it doesn't matter how much money you make. I guess if you make a ton of money, right? If you're LeBron James, you don't need to, you don't need a budget. <laughs> but but most most people, right? Most uh, even upper middle class Americans need to come up with some sort uh, of a budget. So for me personally, I used to do my own budgeting, but after I got married, I've been married almost 15 years now. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing the budgeting, but um, but my if I did the budgeting, my we tried to do that in the beginning. But my wife, um, she doesn't like me managing how she spends her money, so I would be divorced if I if I still did the, the budgeting. So in my family, I do the taxes and I do the um, I do the taxes and I also do the investment stuff. But she actually does the budgeting. So and just to let you know, my wife is also an accountant, so she's responsible. She doesn't like me looking over her shoulder though. Okay, so. Um, so I wanted to just give you guys some a little bit of information about about budgeting. So anyone here can, can budget. You can uh, you can use. I sent you guys a I sent you all a, a sample budget in Excel. But if you're not familiar with how to use Excel, that's perfectly fine. You can just use budgeting using uh, pencil and paper. So let me pull this out here. I have this here. So Cyrus should have sent this to you. If not, you can reach out to to Cyrus. But you see here in this Excel, there's two tabs at the bottom. So this, by the way, this is a, a budget worksheet that I provide to my students, but you can modify it accordingly to your lifestyle. So on this first page is your sources. This is what is called a monthly budget. So on this first page, uh, this lists out what every month, what are your sources of income? So for most of you, you probably have one job. So that would be, you know, let's say you make $3,000 per month after taxes. That's much that may be what you put down, put over here, right? And then if you have a second, like if you have a side hustle or maybe you, you teach at another school, you can list that as your second source of income. You wanna put that as an after tax number, right? You guys all know whatever you make, about 30, 30 to 40% of it gets taken away by taxes or social security or Medicare. So you're probably only left with anywhere from uh, 66 to 60%. So you put that down, right? And if you have any other sources of, of income such as interest income, Right. Sometimes your, your family might give you some gifts, like if it's your birthday, you get like a birthday gift of $100 cash, you list it here. So this is your monthly source of income. And this is budgeted, what you expect, right? And then you see this other tab, this is what your monthly expenses will be. So like car payments, gas, you know, insurance, eating. I think a big one is for a lot of people is what eating out entertainment. So you list all of these expenses here, right? So, um, and the idea is you list them all, all out and the idea is you want your, your um, income to always be higher than your expenses each month. So again, at the start of every month, you just list out all your sources of income that you, that you, that you budget, right? You expect to be coming in and all the expenses that you expect to incur. And at the end of the month, what you do is you actually put down what are your actual actual sources of income, right? Maybe you thought you were going to get, you know, $3,000 per month, but you wind up getting a little bit less because you found out you were taxed some more. And then for expenses, you put down your actual expense, your expenses. And hopefully what happens is there's going to be a difference, right? It's impossible that you can predict exactly how much income and expenses you'll get precisely to the exact number, but hopefully the difference isn't too big. And hopefully um, in the end result is that you didn't wind up in a deficit. And if you did, if you did, then guess what? Next month, you're going to have to revise your budget, right? You're going to have to try to cut back on your expenses or you have to, I mean, it's harder to increase your source of income or make, maybe you take a side hustle job, right? But you have to cut back on your expenses somewhere along the line. And what I want to mention is that um, when you first start budgeting, it's not going to be perfect, right? I remember when I first started budgeting in college, right? When I started budgeting in college, I was off every single month. And so it's, it takes a while. So I think Cyrus, you had mentioned initially that you kind of budget sometimes, but it's not perfect. That's okay. The most important thing is you get started, right? 
So, you know, I used to be in a running club with on the first, nobody's going to expect you in the first day to run. You know, the goal was to train for a half marathon, right? Nobody's expecting you to run five miles on the first day of class or even the first week of class. What happens is you keep working on it, right? And you start fine tuning it. So if you don't budget, I always tell my friends, hey, if you don't budget, nobody's asking you to be a perfectionist, right? Just do your best, right? And during the, the first few months, you might be off a bit, right? Or you might be off by a lot. But the important thing is to fine tune it, right? See where there are places that you can cut your expenses. Because a lot of people just give up too early. They're like, oh, I'm always off. I don't want to think about it. This is just too much work. But you got to stick with it. And I assure you, and this has happened with my students, after half a year, or definitely by a year, you're going to get it down to an exact science. You're not going to be, you're still, it's not going to be 100% perfect, but more often than not, you're going to find that you're going to be um, under budget. You're going to have more sources of income coming in per month than, than expenses, expenses going out. Okay. Being so back to the, I think what kind of colors my experience in a way is that I also like, it, it's the discipline aspect of holding money, I guess. <laughs> like I get, you know. Yeah, like, I'm, gonna talk about that. I'm actually gonna talk about that next. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> so so I, I was gonna say that, um, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, by the end of this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll probably address all your, your points, Cyrus, but, and you can, you can also ask me some more questions too. But I was gonna say, you know, budgeting by, by hand could be, could be budgeting by hand or even by Excel could be tedious because um, we have, it seems like nowadays there's more and more expenses. I remember back when I was in college, there was no cell phone. I'm pretty old, right? There was, there was no cell phones. You didn't have to worry about monthly cell phone bills. There was no Netflix. There was no subscription plan. Uh, it was just my rent, um, food, right? Some sources of entertainment. Life was much simpler. I think nowadays there's just so much, so much more quote unquote fun stuff, right? So um, with so many expenses coming in, it's hard to do it by hand. There's just so many expenses you have to keep track of. And also even Excel is kind of a pain. So what I recommend to make your life easy is to use some sort of budgeting software. So uh, for, for my family, my wife uses Quicken. Uh, it can be purchased for less than $60. Now, my wife told me that Quicken used to be, uh, Quicken used to be able to, she used to buy it and then the, it, you can use that for like three or four years and then she would get a newer version. But now, nowadays she told me Quicken is on a subscription plan service. <laughs> All these companies are always trying to get more money out of you. So I think every year she has to pay for the Quicken service. Now I recommend to my students, I actually use this myself. Remember I told you guys that I, I don't like my wife does the budgeting, but you know, I, I, I just kind of also keep track of my own expenses. She does budgeting, my wife does budgeting for the family, but I just kind of, I'm just curious. I just do budgeting for myself. So I use mint.com and this is what my students use as well. So mint.com is pretty much like Quicken, but the difference is it is actually free. I think mint.com was initially created by Quicken as well, the company that produced Quicken. And by the way, there's no, no such, there's no such thing as free things in life. Eric and I, like to give advice just because we're nice people, right? <laughs> we're already fine financially. So, so we do things for free. There's no catch, right? By the way, we, we don't get paid to do this. We just do it because we want to help people, right? But most people, if people usually try to give you advice, they usually want something from you, okay? So um, even mint.com wants something from you. So the catch is, right? There's such a thing as a free lunch. The catch is with mint.com is when you go to that site, you'll see that they'll periodically, when you register, they'll send you advertisements. They'll, they'll send you, for example, an advertisement to buy TurboTax. They'll send you an advertisement to like join some, some investment thing. Like maybe like, um, yeah, they're, they're, I, yeah, like I think something called Weeble out there or something like that. They'll, they'll just get you to, 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 to uh, buy certain products or join certain programs. Just ignore those, right? Just simply use mint.com for their, for their service. Don't, don't buy anything from them. Okay, unless you really, really want it. Okay, so uh, I could show you how to use mint.com, but there's a couple of issues. One, this is being recorded, so you would see all my personal personal information. And secondly, if I were to walk you through mint.com, it would actually take quite a bit of time. It would take at least uh, half half an hour or maybe an hour at most, right? So I what I have here is three YouTube videos uh, that will show you how to get started with mint.com. And... By the way, this is these are the same videos that I share with um, I shared with my my uh, nephew recently. He he wanted to get budge started with budgeting. He's a college student, and so he watched these videos, and he said they were very easy to uh, understand. 
So I would encourage you after today's uh, presentation to watch those and get started with mint.com right, right away, okay? The sooner you start budgeting, the more money that you'll find that you have uh, in your life to, to save and invest. Now, I want to mention that uh, I want to mention two alternatives, traditional budgeting, and one of them is called the envelope system. And I, I say for people who are not, not numbers oriented, actually, lots of people are numbers oriented. It's just that they choose not to be numbers oriented. And just to let you know, I am actually very bad at math. The subject that I hate the most in life is actually mathematics. But the funny thing is I chose to major in accounting and economics because it's just, you know, part of life is you gotta do things that you hate, right? That are for your own good. I actually hate running. I joined a running club because I know I needed to improve my health. So I tell students, we, you know, as part of growing up in life, you gotta do things that you hate if you wanna get ahead in life. So, uh, but so I was, I still recommend you do this traditional budgeting, but if you really, really, really feel that you're not in numbers-based person, you can use this envelope system. And by the way, this system is endorsed by, by a financial expert by the name of Dave Ramsey. You may have heard about him um, in, in, the, in, you know, like on social media or on YouTube or in the, in the, on the radio program, but he's a guy who gives great financial advice. So, and also, interestingly enough, um, this is actually a system used by my aunt. So my aunt, she, she tells, tells me that she's someone, whenever she looks at numbers, she actually faints. I, I don't know if it's that extreme, but <laughs> this is the system that she and her husband came up with. So this is how the envelope system works. If there's certain things that you're just really bad at controlling your budget, like some people just love to dine out, right? Or some people love to buy shoes and clothing. What you do is every month, right? Instead of putting a budget on a piece of paper and telling yourself, look, I'm not gonna spend more than, more than like 300 bucks per month eating out. What you do is you set up a, a bunch of envelopes, like actual physical envelopes, and you put in each envelope that amount of money that you, you can't spend over that amount, right? So if you put in $300 for, you put in, you set up an envelope, $300 for eating out, $300, uh, maybe uh, $200 for buying shoes every month, right? A certain amount for certain items. And you only, you don't use your credit card. You actually take, whenever you spend that month, you take money out of that envelope. Right. And so that's how my aunt does it. She takes money out of the envelope. And as, as it, it gets closer and closer to getting running out, she notices, oh, shoot, there's less money in here. So she knows to kind of halt her spending. Right. And what happens is what happens if she runs out before the month hits, the, before the month ends. Right. She just simply doesn't buy anymore. She doesn't go out to eat anymore. Right. She has to wait till next month. She cannot pull money from her like her shoe envelope to buy to buy, to, for, to dine out. She has to stick to that budget in the envelope, okay? So I have an example here, right? If you plan to spend 150 bucks for groceries each month and then $100 for eating out each month, you put only put in that much money in the envelope. And once the money runs out, you can't spend until the next month. So that's how you can control yourself, right? Now there's another method um, called the pay, automatically pay yourself first method. This, this works if you, I would say if you're upper middle class and you're fairly well off, I don't really, you know, I, I would prefer, again, I, I both between these two methods, I still prefer traditional budgeting. And with this method, what you do is you, um, you pay yourself first, right? If you get, if let's say you make $3,000 after taxes each, each month. So you simply just say, look, I'm going to save $500 each month. So you, you put that into some sort of investment account or online savings account. And then the rest of your money you spend. You see what I'm getting at? You whatever you want to save, right? You put that away. Everything else you, you spend. And then when you spend everything else, then don't borrow from a credit card. Okay. So that is it for uh, for budgeting. I'm gonna actually move on because we have a limited amount of time. Uh, so I'm gonna move on to the next thing, which is called savings. And then, and then at the very end, we'll we'll do Q and A. Okay. So then my next topic is on savings. So if there's anything that you take away from today's talk. I mean, maybe some of you still won't do budgeting. I hope you guys do budgeting, but there's just one thing you should that you can easily do from today's presentation on, on my end, from, from my presentation part, is I encourage you to uh, open up an online savings account with, with an online bank. And that is because if you do that, your money will grow uh, at least for, will grow 40 times faster than with a traditional uh, savings account. Okay, so when I ask my students, I would say, 99% of my students uh, bank with traditional brick and mortar banks. When I say brick and mortar, these are banks that you can actually walk to, right? So 99% of my students bank with Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Chase. And why did they do that? It's just because 
is that's what they're that's where their parents banked, right? That's where their friends go bank bank. But for me, I say don't do that because those realize that those banks they have to pay a lot of expenses themselves. They're a business, right? They have high labor costs, they have high overhead costs, they have to pay rent. So my advice is open up. You can still open up a regular checking account with that traditional brick and mortar bank. But what I recommend is you also own uh, open up an on, a, a online savings account with an online bank. Okay, online bank because with an online bank, online banks don't have to pay as many employees, right? They don't have to at, at the very minimum. They don't have to pay rent. They have no. They have significantly lower overhead costs. So you can go to this website called Bankrate.com. Eric earlier had already mentioned that website, Bankrate.com. It's a great financial resources website. And uh, go there and look at the different um, online banks that are out there. They're paying much, much higher interest rates than a traditional brick and mortar bank. So I, you know, you know, I personally use Discover Bank. And by the way, I'm not getting paid <laughs> to advertise them. I use Discover Bank and I encourage my students to use Discover Bank as well because um, I personally used it, right? And they have, not only, they have pretty good rates, but not only that, they have excellent customer service. So, um, you know, I would encourage you to try them out. But again, you can also go to bankrate.com to look up other, 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 other banks. But some of the other reasons why I like Discover Bank is that there is no, um, at least when I opened it or my students opened it, you know, not too long ago, there's not uh, a minimum amount to open it up with. So you can put in a dollar if you want to. If you're risk adverse, you're like, some people don't like to try things. Like, like they don't want to go jump full in first. So you can open up with just a dollar if you want to, right? But just put a dollar in there. And there's no minimum. You don't have to maintain a minimum balance. There's no hidden fees that I know of. Um, and so before today's presentation, I actually looked. And um, as of right now, on March 4th, 2021, uh, Discover Bank is paying an interest rate of 0.4%. OK, you contrast that to what Chase Bank of America Wells Fargo is paying. A lot of people don't. A lot of people just put their money in a bank. They don't know how much the bank is actually paying them in interest. But uh, this is the reality. Banks are paying, like these three banks and many other banks out there are paying 0.01%. That's not 1%. That's a hundredth of 1%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you can easily do is just open up a Discover Bank online savings account. It's also like a regular bank. It's FDIC insured. So, you know, you're, you're not going to lose your money, right? So... You know, 0.4% versus 0.01%. That's 40 times more, right? Wouldn't you get pissed off, right? Would you get really, wouldn't you get upset if you found out someone got paid twice as much as you did, right? You'd be outraged, right? And if you found out someone paid, got paid five times more, you'd be really, really angry, right? But I don't understand why so many people are not outraged that they're only, <laughs> that another bank is paying 40 times more than, than this, right? So, you know, I again, a lot of a lot of my friends come to me for financial advice all the time, and I said the easiest thing you could do is open up an online savings account. There's really no risk, right? Just open it up. You can still keep your Wells Fargo bank if you want. I still have my Wells Fargo bank account. Just, just I just have it out of habit, I guess. But, but just periodically, just transfer some money don't you need to use right away into that Discover bank and just get paid forty times more, right? So. So Ming, what, how, what are your um, uh, thoughts or uh, opinions on uh, using a credit union over a bank? Yeah, credit unions are great too. Credit unions pay a much uh, higher interest rate than traditional brick and mortar banks. But I don't know if they're competitive against these, like things like Discover Bank, because credit unions still have to pay rent, right? They still have a, a physical location. So they're not, you, you can check if they pay, if they pay close to 100% online bank, then go for it, right? Credit unions are just as good as regular banks. Gotcha. And uh, would you say that online banks are, are safer uh, than? They're equally as safe. As long as you're FDIC insured, they're, they're equally as safe. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I had originally had some stuff prepared here about investing, but we just don't have enough time because I wanted to save some time for, for Q&A. So maybe this could be a, another presentation in the future about investing, because if you just the most important thing is to budget, right? And then put into an online savings account. But if you just do an online savings account, 0.4% is still not enough to make your money grow. You have to learn how to invest your money, right? Um, you know, people talk about wealth inequality all the time. Of course, in earning income is one thing, 
But the other thing is learning how to invest money. But it's sad that it's not actually it's not a mandatory course uh, taught in college. So um, let me just drop down here at the very end. I want to mention some helpful resources because even if I were to do another presentation, well, I'm you know Eric and I are pretty busy, so we probably couldn't do one this semester. But even if we were to do another one in the fall, I want to mention that um, you know we can't really help people in just an hour, right? You have to be proactive yourself and being financially literate. And unfortunately, like I said, it's not taught in school unless you, of course, take um, Eric's uh, pers you know, personal finance or investment class. But I encourage you all to, I've listed here my top five books I recommend people read to be financially illiterate. Uh, financially illiterate. Um, I Will Teach You Be Rich. This name sounds cheesy, but it's a really, really good book. Um, the Automatic Millionaire, maybe you can skip this one. I just kind of explained how that system works. So let's just knock this one off. <laughs> okay. Um, I Will Teach You Be the Rich, Total Money, Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey, uh, Quit Like a Millionaire. This is a really good one about investing. And then most of you have probably heard of the book Rich Dad, uh, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. It's just a way of um, making money or, or living a certain lifestyle so that you um, can save as much as you can. So these are all pretty good books. Now, I know some people, like, they just not disciplined to read all the time. So um, if you're someone who likes to listen to the radio, um, I know ho hopefully COVID-19 will go away soon and we'll be back on the road again. And so if you listen to the radio, I would encourage you to listen to Dave Ramsey and Clark Howard. So Dave Ramsey provides general personal finance advice. Clark Howard is really big on teaching people how to save, right? Um, both mm -hmm. of these programs. And uh, if you, since we're, most of us are not driving right now because of COVID, there are certain YouTube channels I encourage you to watch. So Dave Ramsey has his own show on YouTube. Chris Hogan, he works closely with Dave Ramsey, has his own show. Clark, Clark Howard has his YouTube, uh, YouTube videos you can watch. And um, uh, here's three other ones I wanna mention. Out of all, all of six, my favorite YouTube channel is this one, Our Rich Journey. So this is, a, um, this is a couple, they actually retired when they were 39 years old and now live in Portugal, but they were government employees and they basically did the right things. They read the fine, pers right personal finance books and they're now multimillionaires retired in Portugal from just earning government jobs, right? Like, like us. And, uh, and what I really, really love about them is they're very down to earth in what they say. And they, the way they present it, their videos are just really easy to understand. I always encourage my students to watch this uh, YouTube channel. And these two, two, these two guys at the bottom, um, Graham, uh, Graham Stephan, he, um, I like him, he's, he's really good as well, but his videos tend to be over like, I think 10 or 15 minutes long, mainly because he wants to generate YouTube ad revenue, right? He's into making money, but he, he does provide good advice. It's just sometimes it's just too long, right? And then finally, this guy named Beat the Bush. I, I actually like him. I actually invited him to come to SMC. I invited both of these people, by the way, but they, I think we couldn't pay them enough money to come. <laughs> I think the foundation would only offer I think $1,000, but that's not enough to get them to come. Um, most people in life don't do things for free, by, by the way. <laughs> I wish they did. Uh, but uh, I got Beat the Bush to come uh, to present to students. Uh, people like them a lot. I actually like him, but my wife banned me from watching his videos because he's a, he's a cheapskate. So he, he, he does give people great ideas, but it's, you have to be really, really frugal. And so my wife hates it when I watch him because um, <laughs> I try to apply it in our family life and she's threatening me with divorce. So um, I, I'm not allowed to watch his videos anymore, but you can, right? I think he's great. So my, my, my final comment is, um, is uh, whatever, you know, the stuff that I shared here as well as with Eric, I really encourage you to take action because I, I look at my students, right? Some of my students take my advice and, and open up an online savings account, right? Or do budgeting. And I, and I see them a, a year or two later and they're like, thank you, professor. Like I've actually been able to save a lot of money now. Other people, they're just like, oh, you know, I, I'm too tired. I, I just, I just, you know, I should have done that. But, you know, so many people, actually, they actually came to me and said, oh, professor, I really wish, you know, that other classmate of yours, you know, we're friends and they took your advice and they did it. And, you know, my budgeting, right, there's budgeting, is, there's no risk in budgeting. It's just being careful how you spend. And they're like, I wish I did it. I'm like, you can do it now. They're like, okay, okay, I'll get to it. Oh, oh, oh. So take action, do it. And, and also, once you do it, I want you to pay this forward, right? Eric and I are not getting paid for this. We are doing this because we want to make society a better place, right? We want to help others. So once you do this and you get the hang of it, I want you to teach someone else, right? Teach a friend, teach a family member so that we can pay it forward and help our society be a better place.
So that's it for my presentation. Um, I'm gonna stick around if people have any questions. Great, thank you so much, Ming. Um, I, I did uh, notice that we had one question in the chat uh, that I'll bring up right now, but after that, we'll we'll open up for um, for questions. So the question was, how do you verify that an online bank is FDIC insured? It should say on it should say on there they're FDIC insured. Gotcha. If you look on their site, they, they should say say it right. Mm -hmm. So so I want to go back again. You know, with Bankrate.com, they they basically plug plug in all sorts of online banks. Just be very careful, right? So, so uh, you know, there's all sorts of banks that, that pop up. Try to pick one that's, that's more reputable, right? So like, like I said, Discover Bank is right now paying 0.4%. Per, 0 .4%. There might be another one that's paying 0.45%. That extra 0.05% is not worth it if that bank is sketchy. So I, um, you know, like, that's why I just tell students straight off, just go with Discover. I mean, Discover Bank is the same thing as Discover Card, right? So they're very reputable, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Any questions so far? Change the. I do have a question about investing. There's a lot of like apps out, like Robinhood, and, like you can do the Cash App. Like, do you have a preferred? I do. That, app? that would be a you know I, you know if, again if I do a presentation in the in the fall that would be a topic. Um, so first off, you, we, we're, everyone here is an SMC employee, right? So you guys should totally take advantage of, 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 of the tax shelter plans that are available to us, the 43B and 457 plans. So I used to talk to, um, I forgot there was a, the person who used to be in charge of, um, of benefits. She, she's now moving on to another place. I forgot her name, but I asked Heather. her like- Heather um, Mamarian? Yeah, yeah, she was great. Heather. And then so she, mm -hmm. she, I asked her like, how many people are taking advantage of the 403B and 457 uh, tax shelter plans? And she said, not many people. And I'm like, what? That's one of the biggest perks of working here at SMC, right? And so, yeah, you should, you should take advantage of those. And, you can, and, and, and also, like, people ask me about doing, like, robo-advisors and stuff. I, I encourage people to use uh, Charles Schwab. I, again, I don't get paid by them. But I, Schwab, I like Schwab because Schwab is um, – Schwab is – uh, pretty easy to use, and they also have, they also have great customer service. And uh, another feature about Schwab is I like to donate to charities, and so they, they have a special Schwab charitable account feature to it. So I would recommend um, uh, Charles, Charles Schwab. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Ming. This was very very helpful, even though it was only an hour. Yes, thank you so much. Like new information some stuff i had heard before so that you know solidified it and verified it for me this is very useful <laughs> hey, can i was, was it deanna i want to mention that another feature of schwab that's available now is that and i shared this with students is that traditionally when you go to a regular uh, brokerage account and buy stocks right buy stocks they will only let you buy one share at a time so right now amazon is being traded at what three thousand dollars a share so th that's a barrier of entry, right? Not many people can buy one share of Amazon stock, which costs $3,000. Right. But with Schwab now, they have a program called Schwab Slices, where you can buy fractional shares of these companies. So yeah, maybe you can't buy one share of, uh, of um, Amazon stock, but can't you buy $5 worth of Amazon stock? So that's like what, uh, $5 is like 0. 0.0000 something percent of a, of a company stock, right? So I think, right. I think you can buy small increments. You can buy five, I, I don't know if it's $5, but I'm pretty sure the lowest increment is like, anywhere from five to $10. So I told my students like, like if you want, you can try to experiment, right? Just buy, everyone can save like five or $10 per month, right? No matter how poor you are, just, just don't buy a Starbucks coffee. I know a lot of my students like to drink Starbucks for some reason, but I'm like, if you're, if you're complaining that you're poor, you shouldn't be drinking at Starbucks and you shouldn't be wearing Nikes, right? Just buy some cheap brand of shoes. Take that money and then start investing, right? Invest in index funds, invest in, invest in, um, in some stable stocks. That, that could be a total top, long topic for another day because I you know I know we're over time so yeah we may bring you back for that one I mean what was that Amazon piece you were you were just referring to what was it called I if you open up a, a Schwab account there's Schwab has a new feature well I don't know if it's new anymore it's been around for a while it's called Schwab slice so instead of buying uh -huh. one share of a stock you can buy fractional shares right mm -hmm. oh fraction that's what you were saying okay yeah, fractional shares and so mm -hmm. my students have tried it too I think the thing is a lot of people a lot of people are, are afraid of doing new things because they yeah. don't have 
friends and family members who've done it. Like my dad, my parents never invested in stocks. You know, my dad is, um, my dad is 70 something years old. And until recently, he find I've been telling him since for years about tax advice, um, financial advice. He was, he wouldn't listen to me. Right. He just says, Oh, just work really hard and just put your money in a, in Wells Fargo. It was up until recent. And I said, dad, like I'm your son, I'm not trying to scam you. Right. I don't want any money from you. Like <laughs> some advice. I'm not charging you any money, but he wouldn't listen to me because none of his friends do anything. He's just used yeah. to doing things a certain way. And then finally, now just a couple of days, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, he finally started listening to me. He says, Oh man, you know, Hey, can you, can you, uh, can you give me some advice now? It took years to <laughs> listen. because people, we are creatures of habits and we surround with ourselves with people who think exactly the same way. Right. And also there are people who are, are scam artists out there, right? Most people don't give free advice. And I would actually say, don't trust most people out there. Okay. And uh, uh, is it possible for you to scroll back down to the YouTube videos that you said? Oh, the, yeah, sure. But the document I, I already sent out to, to Cyrus, he can, he can give it to you oh, all, okay. but these are all. Oh YouTube. yeah, the, the Ramsey one on YouTube. I love yeah. it. I have the total money makeover on CD. <laughs> yeah, but but I say, this love is it. my favorite. This is my favorite uh, channel. This couple, like they're, they're, I mean, like, all these people are real, right? But they, this is my favorite by far. I want you to watch this immediately after today's presentation. <laughs> this one. Yeah, that one I wrote down. It was the other two, the top two that I didn't get. One, it was the one that says Dave Ramsey. Oh, the Ramsey show. Okay. Yeah. Cyrus, I think there was one more question in the chat before we- Correct, yeah. So a little bit off topic, but what's the best way to save for a college? Either your for your own college or for uh, your-, your Excellent, alumni. excellent question. So the best way to save for college is open up something called a California, you don't have to be California, but 529 plan. So that's what I do with my own kids, California 529 plan. So just Google California 529 plan. You can set one up in like 15 minutes. I've actually gotten my students to do that. Like I have a, a couple of students who already have kids. Uh, just Google, it's called California Scholarship, California 529 plan. You can set it up. And so you, it works the way, same way as a Roth IRA. You just simply put money in. Uh, you can just set it link to your checking account and, and put money in periodically. By the way, every, every once in a while, they have a promotion where if you open up an account, they'll give you like a hundred bucks or 150 bucks. So, um, but don't, don't wait, don't just, don't wait until the promotion, just do it right now because the, the California 529 plan is a natural tax shelter. So we live in California. So I hope you realize we're tax really, really, really high. So you know, the best way to save money is to take advantage of legal tax shelters. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know, uh, I want to say Professor Cesar Rubio is really our tax expert. He teaches tax here at SMC. Last time he came with myself and Eric and, and also presented, but he was busy this semester. He is really the true tax expert at SMC. He, he also leads a VITA program where he and his students prepare low income, uh, prepare tax returns for low income families fantastic guy he would have loved to have been here but he, he just had something going on this semester but normally he is the true expert yeah he has a course on uh tax law or, or, or tax that I, I really wanted to take myself because oh, totally take that totally take that take yeah because you could become class. a tax preparer yeah i think you know yeah. i'm not trying to plug our classes because we, we have plenty of students but but his tax class uh accounting 15 accounting 17 totally helpful Eric, Eric's class, personal finance class, investment class, very helpful. I teach you one unit personal finance class. I think for you all, it might be a little bit too basic. So don't, don't take it. It's, it's just too, too, too watered down. Take, it's for people who absolutely have zero, zero no knowledge. But take the three unit classes, the three unit personal finance class and the three unit investment class and the three unit tax classes. They will change your lives, life you know, from a financial perspective, astronomically. So, yeah. Fabulous. Right. Well, I guess uh, so. We are at uh, five oh eight, uh, which puts us at the end of our time. Uh, Carrie, will I'll definitely farm that uh, question out to both Eric as well as Ming. Uh, but um, this formally concludes uh, today's uh, presentation. I'll end the recording right now.